continuing a little bit, if you recall along the general lines that we were talking about of how real power, real power comes about through and based upon one irreplaceable ingredient, and that is a monopoly. Everything else is debatable. Everything else can be interchanged. Other aspects within certain limits are fungible. Exclusivity is what's required for power. You lose that, there is no power. Two princes, two kings attempting to, shower, to share power over some domain, you surely understand there is no real power. If you're one of the kings and you know that somebody can come along and have anything to say, that is not real power, absolute power. And in particular, what we started talking about, how this might relate to human knowledge. Right, specifically to start us, consider that it is an essential, it is an inherent responsibility of all things, of all processes, to protect themselves, to defend what will prove to be their genealogy. Now, old ordinary intellect could respond to that by saying it's somewhere between silly, irrelevant, or by God just downright wrong. Because if, would say ordinary intelligence, I'll speak for it, if I'm hearing you correctly, which you are, if I'm hearing the words correctly, what you're pointing out is not some responsibility, it's not something even worth noting, it would simply be the kind of self-defense mechanism that would be native to anything. Everything from a tree puts out all sorts of poisons, alkalize to keep away certain insects, certain bugs, and of course an animal. Some other sentient beings will respond to those that could present a danger. And it could say, so what? You're not saying anything. And in fact, if it took the sentence, as I put it, that it's an inherent, essential responsibility, it would say, no, no, responsibility is not the word. You're talking about something that would simply be a natural outgrowth, would be a natural attribute of something alive that would defend itself. That just goes to show, again, if you can follow, I know that perhaps does not strike you as an atomic bomb in your brain yet, but wait just a second. That's the kind of thing that ordinary intelligence must deal with that it feels as though I came in in the middle. Assuming the ordinary intelligence heard the sentence and even had just a glimpse of, all right, that almost rhetorically makes some sort of sense. It's wrong. What I miss? Where'd I come in? That's the whole point about ordinary intelligence. As long as you're dealing with episodic thinking, either you take the satisfying conclusion in the everyday sense, or you feel as though, wait a minute, I came in in the middle. It's always that way. The, wait a minute, I came in the middle of somebody else's sentence. Whereas if you're in the midst of a process, perhaps, that is, you're standing in a stream, in a river, and then nobody's damming it up, how are you going to feel like you came in the middle? But don't feel like you missed it yet. <laughs> Remembering specifically now that knowledge, when I said all things and all processes have as one of their essential inherent responsibilities, the protection of themselves, the defense of their genealogy. Knowledge is certainly one of those things. Knowledge, human knowledge is not operational, it is not valid, unless it is operating on the basis of exclusivity. Whatever it is that a man's thinking at any particular time. Now, how about some very hard examples in the sense of fleshy? <coughs> examples that would seem to be right out there in the world. In the sense that part of knowledge's responsibility is to protect itself. At least keep in mind those words for a few minutes until you begin to get your own grasp. Not that knowledge, the same way if we were trying to allegorically speak of knowledge as being a thing like an oak tree. Don't take 
the idea that part of its responsibility is to protect itself and say, well, part of its aspect, part of its nature, no, 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 part of its responsibility is to protect itself. I can't resist. I want to maybe even confuse you, but some of you help before it even gets further. Notice, ordinary intelligence, again, if it was listening to this in the way that perhaps up until this point you are trying to, and it just literally is being dealt with, ordinary intelligence could take what I've said and say, well, wait a minute. If I'm hearing part of what you're saying, you're saying, or are you saying, that something was created just for the sake of defending itself? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> Jesus. But is that not one of the most immediate possible interpretations, assuming this still made some sort of sense or ordinary intelligence did not perceive the importance but was trying to humor me, trying to consider that maybe there is something to this. What's the best they could come up with was probably that. That, wait a minute, you're saying, when you say that the inherent essential, I didn't throw essential around casually, essential responsibilities, not ingredients, not characteristics, not aspects, not mechanisms, responsibilities is to defend itself, protect itself. Ordinary intelligence could say, well, all right, what you're saying, in essence, you're saying that there are things created simply for the sake of protecting themselves, which obviously has got to be a supreme waste of time. Why would any... I'm going to tell you one more time, ordinary intelligence, that's not what I said. And then ordinary intelligence says, boy, you're having at me tonight, aren't you? <laughs> Old stick. Setting me up and then slapping me around. Hey, what do you think intelligence, ordinary intelligence is made for? <laughs> it's too easy now in the Western world. They have clamped down on the kinds of hanky-panky gaffed games at carnivals. So, you know, where's the fun anymore? I understand it's very hard nowadays, what few carnivals are left, that there are even law enforcement officers in certain localities that will show up and make sure that some of those cats <laughs> will actually fall off if you hit them with a ball. <laughs> so, if we can't have that, we'll have it at intelligence. Set them up, knock them down. Three for a dime. Send in your dimes later. <laughs> But ordinary intelligence could say, well, uh, what you're saying is that there are things that are created just for the sake of protecting themselves, which has got to be somewhere between a waste of time or some kind of self fuel and going nowhere piece of machinery. Why would life create something and its job is, all right, now that you're created, it creates something. This thing says, all right, here I am, what do I do? Protect yourself. That's all. I didn't say that. But notice. That is the kind of thing, the ordinary intelligence stepping in the middle, <coughs> what can it come up with, assuming it was still trying to make some sense out of this? But let's skip ordinary intelligence and see if we <laughs> can make any sense out of this. <laughs> we, we. All right. I was going to try and give you some hard examples. In the sense, going back to now, not oak trees, but human knowledge, the thing knowledge, what ordinary intelligence thinks is its currency, what it thinks is its rightful payoff. It is the object of all of its sentences. It's the whole contest of trying to think in the ordinary sense. That if I'm going to think about something, what I want to do is come up with something I wouldn't think about unless I thought it would reach some kind of reasonable conclusion. So ordinary intelligence resulting, being given an exclusive franchise by life, it sees its monopoly as being, the payoff as being knowledge. So knowledge itself, I'm speaking of as a thing right now. Knowledge is, one of its inherent essential responsibilities is to protect itself. Now how does that operate in everyday life? All sorts of ways, but there are several that you might enjoy that might help. One is in the sense that this self-protection plays itself out in man's secondary affairs by experts. I remember that word. We'll stay with that for a little bit. Experts. No sarcasm intended. 
but what everyday life refers to as the experts in some area. The experts, part of their responsibility is to protect and defend their expertise when it is ultimately indefensible. <laughs> Now put away your little sarcasm suckers. But consider. Experts, we can pick out all sorts of things. How about psychology? The city calls upon experts in psychology to explain why, in any number, why certain people cannot express themselves emotionally. Whatever the hell that means. Nowadays it means something in this city. I don't want to think about it. Why, can't, why some people can't be very emotional if they can't express it? They just can't be emotional. Right. By any, you know, remember I said it's ultimately indefensible. You should know by now anything carried far enough if you ask ordinary intelligence, not psychologists, they're just representing ordinary intelligence. The, let us say that the best that the city has to offer. Let's not dwell on that. But just consider that they may be the best that some particular city or some quarter in the city has to offer. But you know that if they're going to say that something caused an individual, I mean, because it is uh, accepted, if not tacit, if not verbal, it's an accepted fact that people should be, at least in the Western world, expertise is always local. But at least here in our day and time, people should be, or at least be able to express their emotions, even if they're hostile. That men and women, husbands and wives, family members should be able to say, you know, sometimes I just despise you. Well, good, good, good. Let it out. Well, you know how that goes. But everyone, if it's pushed far enough in the city, is turning to the experts in psychology saying, well, why is it that someone is like that when we have already agreed that that is not the most healthy, conducive condition in which a contemporary human should live? Why is this person or any person, why are they like that? Mr. Expert and the psychologist comes out, and it's always something that something calls the person. The answer to all whys, of course, is well, and it's generally the basis no matter whether they're Freudian or whatnot, and of course you can apply this to religion and all sorts of other areas. But they don't have to be Freudian, they don't have to be anything particular. What they're going to come up with is the good old, they'll fall back. They would probably be loath to use such terms since it would have religious connotations, but they always fall back upon the good old Old Testament idea of the sins of the fathers or passed along. And when I say it's ultimately indefensible, everybody knows this. You can't think about it, but you know you can't say, well, wait, all right, you're saying that this guy's father probably caused him to be like that. Yes. In fact, I have talked to this guy personally, and it was his father. Okay. And he might have great detail that we don't even want to go into. But we just take his, his expertise. He just says it was his father's behavior toward him that caused this guy to now be anal regressive or whatever the hell they call it nowadays. He can't, he can't show his emotions. And so, but everyone understands this without knowing it, without having seen anything. They understand that the sins of the Father, like every other explanation by any expert, is ultimately indefensible because then you say, well, I wonder what caused his father to be like that. Well, I have no doubt that his father had his own problems, saith the expert. So you figure it was probably even his mother and father, probably one or the other, some combination. Well, well, you see that what's coming next. You say, well, wonder what calls them. They cannot explain how the, I'm using this, of course, now truly symbolically. They cannot explain how, once they point out the sins of the fathers, which that's all explanations regarding human behavior nowadays. Always has been. It just now seems to have different trappings that the pointing out here seems to be less metaphysical, spiritual, spooky. But now they point specifically fathers, mothers. The sins of the fathers. 
no one, no one, no one, no one in the city can then tell where the fathers, slash grandfathers, slash great great grandfathers, where they picked up their sins. This kid's bruised because of the kicking of his father, symbolically speaking. But no one knows where his father picked up his bruises, much less where the grandfather. That's what I mean. It is simply, it's no attack, it's no, nothing sarcastic, it's no great major breakthrough, because it doesn't prove anything to ordinary consciousness, and it's certainly not going to get me elected mayor of Mudville. But it is ultimately indefensible. Yet, does that stop? the city, from making humans seek such expertise? None whatsoever. Not even a little bit. I mean, simply because their expertise is indefensible. That is, it doesn't explain anything. Carry just one more, just one or two questions. You know, which is, by some reports, you can look at the Socratic syndrome, or dynamic. You know, the city, take Athens symbolically, the city will finally say, hey, you know, would you, you, know, would you just cut that out? <laughs> you know, we don't need this. <laughs> you get only one or two more questions after the expert has spoken, after you have been blessed by the golden showers, <laughs> don't make up jokes, of expertise. <laughs> the expertise is showered upon you and in the city, you're supposed to be thankful. You're not supposed to say, well, wait a minute. I like that. I like that idea, the sins of the fathers. Ah, oh, I like that. And then afterwards, you catch the expert. You say, oh, I enjoyed that. I wrote it right down. Could I ask you, though, where do you think the fathers picked up the sins and inflicted upon them? And that's when Athens, that's when the speaker will say, kid, get away, you bother me. Because... Ultimately, all explanations at that level, all explanations are indefensible. But note, again, take out all possible sarcasm. Part of the responsibility, now think about it for a second, of psychologists when they show up, and it's not just them, criminologists, religious leaders, anybody. Part of their time is spent. If they show up on a TV show, if they show up at a seminar, what is part of their time and energy spent doing? DTFS. They're fending their fine selves. That was close. It's the preface to everyone's song and dance. It's having to continually condition what you say. Quote others. Which then, if you know, things don't prove good, or the audience says, well, wait a minute, I don't like that, and you say, well, I hadn't had time to fully investigate, but, but who I'm relying on, and they rely on what? Another expert. Because then you kind of shifted it. If they say, well, wait a minute, that last part, I was following along what you said during your commentaries, but then when you start talking about certain kind of inverted anal aggression, I'm not sure I followed that, I'm not sure I agree with it if I did follow it. And you say, well... In ordinary intelligence, this expert says, well, I'm not sure now that you said it. I didn't, I didn't have time while I was up there on the platform, but kid, if I may call you kid. Now that you mention that, I can't tell you that it has my full-hearted endorsement. But after all, Dr. So-and-so, whom, if you notice, or who, I did refer to. I gave him credit for the quote in the audience, the kid. goes, yes, yeah, I know. Well... I'm not sure that I have enough statistical evidence yet to not only not fully support it, but I can't absolutely <laughs> deny it. But I brought it up sort of as to help stimulate your thought processes, and I say it did. Now get away, i got to go. <laughs> All of that fits into the scheme of things. And yet, if pushed just a little bit, and I repeat, this is... You know, you, you know this, but now you can't go out to your mother or father or some friend you've got outside of this and say, Ooh, let me tell you what I thought about. And, of course, you're trying to steal my material, and you, like I didn't tell you. And you say, I just realized, I thought about that all the world's experts, of course, you better be caged. You better say a lot of them. Because <laughs> ordinary intelligence, until you get good, can always trip you up. And don't worry about you and somebody else as you trying to tell yourself something. You go, wait a minute, there's an exception to that. And you say, what? And it points it out, and you go, oh, my God. 
just in case you thought that the whole story about Achilles' heel actually had to do with something about physical having one soft spot. Everybody got one soft spot, and if you don't believe it, pick up one of the great religious icons of our day, a Barbie or Ken doll, and that's where you see the injection form of the plastic. That's the Achilles heel. That's for your own mind, your own thinking at the ordinary level. I always say, wait a minute, don't tell me that all things are so-and-so, because I can tell you one example, one exception. And don't tell me that there's an exception to this. If you tell me that, that just shows that you're not past ordinary intelligence because ordinary intelligence always has a keyhole in the closet. It always has the injection point that ordinary intelligence, as soon as it says, wait a minute, don't tell me that everything I believe is wrong. And this is you talking to yourself. Don't tell me that everything about so-and-so is such-and-such because it will immediately point out an exception that you cannot explain. That's the nature. That's how the slinky goes down the step. <laughs> That's how life goes. That's why it's known as polarized information. The point being, I could take it for a second. You didn't lose your place. And I could make ordinary people, ordinary intelligence for a second. I could make it agree. I might not be able to make it swallow if I said all, but if I said a, whole, a hell of a lot, an unrecognized large portion of life's expertise and their experts, the experts and their expertise, their information, their expertise is not actually defensible. And I could use examples like psychology, and for a second I could get many ordinary nervous systems and go, yeah, but that'd be it. In other words, it would not make them go, oh! I didn't see the light. They just go, yeah, I guess. Notice, we're back now, that was a point for me to go to that. Notice it is part of ordinary expertise's responsibility to defend itself. What you didn't notice was it has successfully done so when you can point out to people, wait a minute, what the experts are saying can't be defended. I mean, you ask them one more question, take it one more step, and the whole thing falls apart. And you can make somebody for a second go, well, yeah. But then notice, they'll go right back to seeking the expertise in this area. So don't say that, hey, that kind of observation is chilling. If you did that to people, ooh, boy, that, that would just split their little skulls open. They'd go, ooh, I do see the light. No, they don't. Notice the success rate, to understate it, of ordinary knowledge, ordinary expertise at the secondary level defending itself because when you point out that its defense is flawed and even get people for a second go, yeah. <laughs> In other words, you can, does everybody follow this? From one viewpoint, you can be right. And you step in the city and say, listen, what I know is correct and you people are wrong. Or what I know is more correct. And they go, okay. And you point out and they go, hey, you're right. For a split second. <laughs> and that doesn't matter. Because, and I'm just using, of course, relative terms, polarized terms. Because if you were right and it, what they were believing in some area was wrong, notice the wrong one. <laughs> Even if you get them to say, wait a minute, that's wrong. And they go, by God, you're right. And they look off and wrong still wins. <laughs> Because it is successful, not wrong, because human knowledge, everything polarized at the city level that's going to live and protect its own genealogy, if it's going to have it, if it's going to have a tomorrow, part of its responsibility is to protect itself. It doesn't matter from ordinary views that you say, well, are we talking about knowledge? But now we're talking about knowledge that's just, it's flawed. The knowledge is wrong itself. So what? Part of its responsibility is not to be right, I didn't even include that. An essential, inherent responsibility of knowledge is to protect itself. It's only kids that wandered in and probably didn't even pay to get in. They will wander up to knowledge later after the speech and try to pull at its leg and say, I think part of what you said is wrong. An ordinary knowledge can go, you know, get the hell away. That ain't the point. I'm on stage, you're not. They paid to see me. Who the hell are you? Symbolism. <laughs> We're not talking about kids and speakers. Uh, I said psychologists. You can fill in your... How about criminologists? They call up on them continually. TV, in person, the government. You help pay taxes. Do they bring on a criminologist? I guess with a capital C. I mean, that's a profession. And, and a man will come on and help explain crime. Criminal activity on the basis, let us say one guy, it's very popular now, always has been, poverty. The thing, poverty. 
And everybody knows, I don't have to attack this much further, that that is ultimately, just one or two questions, is indefensible. Everything is. That ordinary local intelligence and some person, which is, of course, is just life oozing out through a little pinhole in a glove, it comes out and a local authority, a criminologist, says, well, poverty. Here's a case. Where you're you're going to ask me specifically for this example. Yes. All right. And they tell you some background. They've already done their work. Poverty has caused this. And then you just have to say, just one question. If you're good, well, I keep saying one or two questions and everything is indefensible. If you know how, that is, think yourself and not to show off to anybody else unless you want to join <laughs> Brother Socrates in the Hemlock Society, wherever he may be. You don't go out and ask other people, but it's for you to see this for yourself. It's really just one question, because if he says, all right, there's no doubt. And he quotes everybody. He quotes himself. He quotes great other experts. And he says, you're asking why this one kid, decent looking, has a decent IQ, and you're asking why did he engage in this horrible criminal activity? Poverty. And let us say that he makes the speech. Symbolism, we're not talking about people and crowds and speakers. He makes the speech to the audience, to the governmental, to the Senate committee. He says, using this as an example, you want me to investigate using this as the lightning, as the bellwether. This case is exemplary because poverty caused it. And let us say that the audience goes, huh, hmm. Then you come up as a kid and you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I picked up some of the details I wrote down. He grew up in such and such neighborhood in such and such city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how many other people was living in the same conditions around there? And he says, well, X amount of thousands, 10,000. You say, well, how come all of them um, didn't do the same thing? Get the hell away from me. <laughs> Did you pay to get in here anyway? You're too young to understand this kind of crap. One question is all it ever takes. If you know how, not to somebody else, to yourself, to the information that life puts out, the information that if you get out of somebody else's clutches, life's going to have you back, and you're going to think whatever they want you to think, and it's going to be that. Even if you go, wait a minute. Life sort of goes, wait a minute, what? And you go, uh, oh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> it's like staying out maybe in the middle of a track and say, well, well, wait a minute, life, to ordinary knowledge. And life sort of says, like, wait a minute. And it's according to how you want to look at it. you got a choice like, he goes, wait a minute, what? It's like the train's going to leave while you're staying going, what? Or else they got another way, it's going to run over you while you're going, wait a minute. <laughs> the wait a minute is you're just at the verge of seeing, which is unimportant at the ordinary level, that all city expertise, all human knowledge is ultimately, ultimately, I don't mean way off in another life, remember. I'm trying to get you to see now. You're only one question away if you know how to do it. And one question away simply represents one additional burst of certain energy. And so just plugging in the toaster and it says, why did this kid, why did this person engage in a life of crime? And you plug it in or a light and it lights up and it says poverty. Or it lights up and you're asking on the basis of psychology and it says unconscious traumas. The light is not sufficient for some people. If you unplug it and then plug it back in, you get the same light. That is, you follow it. If you ask a question, you should say, wait a minute, I don't like that light. Uh, where did the people who made him do that, where did they pick up their bruises? It's like unplug it and laugh plug it back in. You say, well, it's the same damn light. <laughs> or if you want to know, well, you plug it in the second time and it blows out. <laughs> it is indefensible. You cannot ask an additional question. You cannot try and push the energy that is sufficient to inform, to drive the intellectual machine of ordinary people, you cannot push it any further. You cannot ask the one other question. It's not a trick question, you understand. And it's not the quantity. The Socrates dynamic, get way you know, into symbolism now, not historical. It's not just the quantity of questions, that's the way history has that story that he just kept on and on and on and just drove them nuts. Oh, that sounds good. That's the kind of story that you can swallow. Like, well, imagine some old, I had an uncle like that. Drove you crazy. <laughs> it wasn't the quantity. Quantity doesn't matter. Because you can keep asking quantity as long as it's at city level. And the experts, that's part of their job. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. It's not the quantity. It's to take the question 
past where ordinary knowledge cuts it off. Well, the answer to this is poverty. The answer to this is unconscious, subconscious trauma. Now, if you just leave it there, the quantity of the answers, the quantity of the questions, as long as they stay at that level, it's all right. But if you try and change the level, if you try and take it beyond that and say, all right, sins of the Father, yes? What calls her father like that? Watch it! Do I dare point out that we can forget all of our city experts now that we have covered them, <coughs> laid them to rest, don't send flowers. They ask that you contribute money in their name to me. <laughs> now that we have <laughs> laid the experts, the criminologists, religious leaders, everybody else, we laid them to rest and I consider That in spite of that, life continues to grow within the same kind of facets that it shows, including those that apparently we can take note of as being ultimately indefensible, being episodic to the point that they cannot be carried one step, that is one thought further, in spite of that, which by the way, there is no such thing, no such animal as, quote, in spite of, except at the revolutionist level. I know that people say it in the city, that's where I heard it. But they're talking about unicorns at the city level. At the city level, there is no such thing as in spite of. Well, there is if you believe in trolls and irony. Then they're all part of the same family. <laughs> but it uses what we just pointed out that is ultimately indefensible. That is, it is a flawed, egregiously, fatally, from a subversive view, fatally, flawed concept of why of explanations, of any expertise. In spite of that, we have another great example that surely most of you are familiar with from casual reading, that life will extend itself through that. I'm going to repeat just a second so if you've got the setup, you know where we're going. That, the kind of stuff that we just got through pointing out, that ordinary expertise in the city cannot be defended, no matter what it is. So all you got to do is ask one more question, not, the, not in quantity, but one more question to push it away from the episodic conclusion-based conclusion, thing-based conclusion. You know, all right, sins of the fathers, what, where'd the fathers get theirs? Where'd the grandfathers? All right, at least you think that in some way we have now wrapped up the world of experts and expertise. We haven't wrapped it up unless you are dying to make your own fashion statement by having some sort of neural-based turban. <laughs> because there's an example going on. It's a great one, now that I think. The world of weather forecasting. <laughs> by their own admission, by any reasonable man, just reasonable man or woman that just ever turns on the TV or the radio or a glance at the newspaper and then happens to glance outdoors. <laughs> everyone knows, everyone knows it's just a recognized failure. <laughs> well, now everybody knows that, so... No sense to laugh. If, if you're laughing in any sarcastic way, it just shows how far behind you are because they know it. They accept it. And how? Off and on, it's not complete, I know. But here in the Western world, right now, not just the weather forecasters, I was using that, the ones that are visible on your TV set, but the, which is just one aspect, of course, of a, the science of meteorology, but the weather forecasting, that activity, apparently, 
of the great scientific field of meteorology, which is much more, of course, than just weather forecasting, the study of weather systems, etc. It's a, but as far as forecasting the weather, more than ever today, it is a recognized failure. It is indefensible. If you turn on the TV, and if you say, well, I like to watch channel so-and-so weather, even the TV stations, by the way, they know this. I guarantee you. I mean, it's, it's just no secret. That you know, the weather forecast, to try and forecast the weather 12 hours away, is just a laugh. But they pay these guys money because they have found out that you will tune in, using you genetic, generically, that you will tune in because you like the little comments the guys make or the way he wears his hair. Or you just like his personality. But if you were questioned, if you said, wait a minute, you know, I was over at your house, and you said, wait a minute, I want you to catch the weather because I was you know, going out skiing or something tomorrow. And you turn it on, and you watch, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I said, you realize the odds, you can flip a coin as far as whether it's going to rain tomorrow, and you'll get about the same odds, much less this stuff that's going to reach 78 degrees in our forecast, and it will be sunny starting somewhere between, you know, shortly after noon, probably around 1 or 2. You understand that is a failure. In ordinary intelligence, if you were playing the part of ordinary intelligence, we'd go, well, yeah, I know. So we're back to the same thing of saying, hey, the sins of the Father don't explain anything. Yeah, I know. It can't be pushed, but that just brings up speed. I still wasn't where I was going to point out. It is a recognized failure insofar as it being a serious area of expertise, of forecasting the weather. So what is going on, even as we stand here, the area of experts of forecasting the weather are currently extending and improving themselves, being the experts. I mean, failures at it, but they're the experts. They're the weather forecasters. Well, you're not. I'm not. They are. They're the expert, except their expertise is indefensible, more so than psychologists or criminologists trying to explain specific human behavior. But right now, they are in the midst, even as we're standing here, of expanding and indeed improving themselves. And they're doing it by aligning themselves, by taking advantage of, by referring to a whole new scientific area known generally as the science of chaos. That which I think they generally refer to now, I'm not going to define it, but they're, they, def, they refer to the science or the study of chaos as the growing awareness that what heretofore had seemed to be random activity suggest that there may be patterns. And this little kid over here went, hey, and we thought Einstein was dead. <laughs> All they did was, you know, they didn't just pickle his brain, they cut it up and a whole bunch of people partook of it. Forget all those little religious Eucharist ceremonies. We got some people here that chewed on his brain because, whoo, there might be a pattern in the chaos. Well, <laughs> that's our sarcasm for the night. Now back to real stuff. The study of chaos and what they refer to in the weather systems right quick, it's not important, but it's just they're apparently getting out to the kind of almost third order level of connectedness as I think. They're calling it the sneeze and the butterfly effect of uh, saying, and I'm really, I'm not quoting, but I have, I know that they're doing this, of actually saying that the movements of a butterfly's wings or one person over there sneezing, ultimately, if you carried it far enough and had the facilities either here or technolo technologically, that that could interfere with what was up to that point a fairly reliable forecast that a man was about to make and yet he did not take into account that a person over there behind a tree suddenly sneezed. And they can now, through the great, like I said, not their own minds really, I should blame it on, or give them credit to the great world of what they call computerized picturizations and forecasting. At any rate, they could say and prove, at least mathematically, that that sneeze could have such an atmospheric effect as to ultimately interfere, throw off a prediction 
about the weather tomorrow. That's a fact. Just, just trust me. But notice, this is presented as a breakthrough. But what is it? It is a further elaboration of their failure. Uh, ah, if one person would get that, then we could leave and all have a pear sandwich. Well, there are several things that could be of some practical interest. The one I already mentioned is notice this is the kind of expansion that we've talked about before. The secondary world of man through knowledge, through episodic, conclusive, oriented, thing-based knowledge expands. So here it is. We have an area. We've got to make it simple now, which is not all that hard to do. Weather forecasting, let's call that a thing, an area of expertise, a profession, a calling, a hobby, a thing. And its area of expertise is now by its own admission unreliable. By many people's admission long before that was unreliable. But it's part of life. For those of you that forgot one of the good car routes only recently that somebody pointed out that in city affairs just because you don't know what you're doing doesn't mean you have to stop what you're doing. <laughs> See, a lot of you laughed that night and now you know why. Yeah, but I don't like it. All right. So it didn't stop them. It's now part of life, and there is no why. It would be a how question. But if you're going to start that, then you're going to have to really get good and start asking how you're surrounded by that which is unreliable. It's a secondary level that all information, all experts, all expertise is indefensible, carried just one more step, one more question. But now back to this great area. It's not the only one, but this is a good one. I assume most of you got some awareness so you can hear what I'm pointing out. We got this, let's call the thing weather forecasting, and it is indefensible. It is a failure. But now they refer outside themselves. They're quoting, but except now it's, instead of them saying, well, I believe Matthew Arnold said so and so. It may have been a metaphor. Well, that gets pretty mushy. That's more in line with the great areas of religion and psychology than science like meteorology and weather forecasting, although as a science, it sucks. It's reliability. But now there's a new area, the science of chaos. And they spell it now with a big C. It is a new area of discipline. Chaos. So now they refer that science itself is getting bigger and bigger. We're getting more up to date. And so now there is a science of chaos. And of course, if you're not educated enough to even heard of it, they can kind of dismiss you as a kid that wandered in anyway. You know, get away. If you don't know, I, I can't stop and explain everything to you, kid. Where do you grow up? Go read a book. But now it refers to another area. Chaos, the science of chaos, the study of chaos, was not developed just to prop up meteorologists. And they would say, well, certainly not. It's, it's its own independent discipline growing into a real science. Gaining almost daily. The papers are coming out so fast now, it just we can't keep up. But it just so happens, coincidentally, fortuitously, serendipitously, it just so happens that what they're now discovering in this brand new nascent science has quite specific application to guess who? Us. Is that great Dr. Powell used to say, surprise, surprise. <laughs> we find some application that in the area of chaos, it shows that that which seems to be random, which what they're also saying, if you ask them, is they're saying the weather is proved to be so random <laughs> that our forecast, you know, you might as well cast tea leaves. But now, the science, the growing science of chaos begins to show why it is so difficult. Not difficult, impossible. Well, all right, kid. But why it's been so difficult heretofore for us to actually forecast in a reliable way the weather. Now, that's the first part. But you understand, at city level, that's about it right there, if you've got any interest. People's lives are not dependent upon whether warf, uh, weather forecasters are correct or not, not normally speaking. Just everyday people nowadays in the city world. All right. What's it going? It's going if it's going to rain tomorrow, it's going to rain. 
Now you can go out in the morning and that you were planning to cut your grass or to go skiing and you look up and go, boy, they said it was going to rain. Well, so what? Whether you knew it or not, it rained. But notice at the city level, where the secondary world exists, out there and here, which out there is here, it would now seem to be of some importance that their failure is not all the faith that, you know, we just assume that they just didn't know what they're doing. No, they're already at the point to realize there are more, there are more factors involved. There are more aspects of the weather. It's such a complex, systematic, interconnected, something or other, that it makes it hard, it makes it hard for us to actually forecast it. But rather than us just having to say, well, it's just a whole bunch of confusion, there's a science now called confusion. I'm sorry, chaos. <laughs> With a, big, with a big C. And part of what it is now discovering helps explain, helps extend our science. No, it doesn't. This is presented as a breakthrough. Now, chaos is doing its own thing, the science of chaos. But the weather forecasters are saying now we're part of the breakthrough because we can make use of this new information. Make use how? Here's the kind of question, see, that wants, what are they doing? Is the, is the forecasting any better? Hey, kid, don't ask dumb questions. No, the answer is no. It has not improved the weather forecasting one iota. What's it done, though? Now part of weather forecasting, which, that area of expertise, is an abject failure. They admit it. Except now, they got a new explanation. They have progressed. That now we can tell you why it's been so difficult. We knew it was difficult. Damn, we've been driving ourselves crazy. We don't go in there every day and make wrong forecasts. We, it's not a joke. We have a, done our best. Oh, you poor, I, you know, send them a beer on me. We've done the best we can, but now we can help explain. But you understand, all this comes through, as it's supposed to, as an expansion, an elaboration, progress in that field. I ask you again, can you see? with the cold, murderous eye of a revolutionist, a silent revolution, nothing to say, but can you see? All it is is an expansion, an elaboration of their admission of failure. Because the question, the additional question that could not be withstood now was if you had the greatest expert in weather forecasting, the man who knows much more about the science of chaos than we do. A man who now may be spending a large part of his time studying, trying to keep track in a parallel way, the science of chaos instead of just meteorology. And he can begin to tell you more than you would ever want to know about how heretofore randomness is being seen as having certain large, long-range <coughs> patterns with a specific application to the difficulties of predicting the weather. And so he does all that, and you listen, and you listen, and you listen. And you say, well, has it improved one iota your ability to forecast the weather? The answer is no. But you're not supposed to ask that question. Not because they're dumb or in some sort of ordinary conspiracy. That is not the kind of energy that makes life expand and grow. But notice, nobody thinks to ask the question. It is not part of the systematic growth of life, for somebody to ask the question. If they did, it would strictly be an anomalous, snot-nosed kid that wandered in, that is, some part of life's body that's not going anywhere. And that's what they're kicking about, get away, because they wouldn't even bother to answer. Because no, nobody of any consequence is going to ask. That is, no part of life's own body is going to go, boy, am I still doing that kind of dumbness I was before over there with these bunch of humans? I had a whole bunch of them saying, we're going to forecast the weather. <laughs> then I had an even larger bunch going, oh, yes, we're interested in that. And it never works. And nobody ever seems to, and it just keeps going on. No, no, no. But notice the explanation, the breakthrough, the progress, the ah, we understand more clearly than ever why it is so hard, not hard, impossible, why it is so hard to forecast the weather. In other words, why we are un undeniable failures at this. We're the experts, and we can't do it. And everybody knows it. They know it. You know it. Yes. But ha! The science of chaos, and more specifically, as applied to us in particular, the butterfly effect. And they have it now. I've seen it. Quotation marks. Big letters. Big B. 
Big E. <laughs> the butterfly effect. And you listen, you read it, you go, it's a nice hobby. Yes, well, yes, yes, yes. And if you left, and you're going, huh, huh. And you're the kind of guy that's been making cheap jokes about weather forecasting. And you read that, and you go, huh, huh. And you walk off, and I come up. Some spirit of subversiveness says, what was all this stuff you're going, huh, huh, like... I mean, were you trying to imply that now you thought better of them? Well, yes. I mean, it begins to make more sense. So, <laughs> it does? Well, yes. You do hear it. doesn't make it more sense. It is not an expansion of their knowledge. It's not an expansion of their expertise. It's an expansion. It's an elaboration of their failure, of their ignorance. Not just them, but everybody. That's what an expansion of human knowledge is at that level. It's always an expansion of ignorance. That's why it's polarized. If you didn't have ignorance having to do with everything that humans say they know, it could never expand. What would it expand to? What it does is apparently take one end of the stick, part of the ignorance, and it turns it into knowledge, as they call it. There's no way to look at it, quite proper way. All they've done is expand the ignorance. Uh, we sure are getting close to running out of tape, but maybe I can trust some of you to go with this. Surely that you can see part of what we're talking about tonight, about how knowledge, how the experts of the world, no conspiracy, no, no exceeding, exceedingly dumb, behind-the-scenes machinations on their part, but all human knowledge, whether it be in areas that are classified as being professionally based, scientifically based, all human knowledge is ultimately indefensible. It will not withstand one more question if you knew how to ask it. And yet the, the experts continue to not only exist, but people turn to them. Not because the people are dumb, that's just part of the arrangement of life. So I assume that, let's, I'll, I will assume rhetorically that some of you now get a different order idea about how ordinary knowledge, like everything else, the part of its inherent essential responsibility is to protect itself. With no question about, well, it's wrong. If it's knowledge, part of its responsibility is to protect itself. All right, can you see what I was just talking about before this? That's also true of what people would call ignorance. That ignorance equally is charged with the responsibility of protecting itself. I know it sounds silly on the surface. Why is it so hard for people to learn stuff? Why does knowledge seem to come so slowly? Why is it that knowledge never seems to, never proves to be the final piece of knowledge? And you can explain it other ways. Well, I don't know. Maybe people who don't have enough education, maybe poverty has drained people's brains of certain needed fluids. How about look at it another way? What ordinary intelligence, what ordinary thinking calls ignorance is also protecting its position. No? Well, I think I'm going to leave the rest of it with you. As strange as that may sound about ignorance having to defend itself, maybe we can wrap a real quick little wrap. Look at it another way. All attempts to explain oneself. All those attempts have got to speak in whatever way you do it. That is, you're explaining why. You're the expert on you instead of the weather forecasters trying to explain the weather. You're trying to explain you. You must explain yourself on the basis of a polarized world. <laughs> and on that basis, you are consistently, that is what you're picturing and describing yourself to be, you are consistently in the company of adversaries in a polarized world. At least half of everything you're surrounded by, thought-wise, knowledge-wise, is a potential adversary. And therefore, no matter what you say you know about you, all explanations about what everybody is has got to conjure up the picture of adversaries. 
taken a bit further, everything that seems to be knowledge has got to conjure up its adversary.